uh, we seem uh, we can parametrically control it. Uh, but but there may be uh, reasons for that bad weather. I think there is the theory that somehow when the energy of human beings moved on the surface of globe and it reached a certain uh, a level of intensity, somehow the dynamic flow of the sky will change and cause a uh, special effect. And I rather related the bad weather to a great gathering here of great minds, great ideas, and great energies, hopefully, through this uh, forum. Um, I also wanted to introduce a little bit of the background of uh, how uh, things come together and form this forum. Uh, the school has uh, focused uh, last two semesters on how technology integration and how the roles of architects actually transform in rather difficult time and particularly a time where everything is put in doubt and delayed and this is perfect time for rethinking uh, what we have done uh, for uh, physical conglomerations and new ways of conden condense uh, human conditions. Um, and then uh, with that idea, we have um, uh, established uh, different studios and workshops and look into um, how uh, those thinking can be um, dealt in classroom and in a setting that is uh, academic institution. We have uh, Neil Leach, uh, Roland Snook, um, Roland, um, Francois Roche, and uh, his partners, Mark, and then we also, on that line, uh, dealing with um, new tools in dealing with large uh, challenges of built environment, but also bringing uh, rather th sociological, um, political thinkers in how cities actually always uh, have thrive and always have to resist new forces. Uh, on that line, we have um, we have Stefano Di Martino. Uh, we also have uh, Menu Castello to kind of um, relate to really form a critique and how the new hope that actually could be then brought in a large framework that sometimes traditional yet uh, uh, um, yet uh, persistent and um, stubborn in the forming of uh, urban thinking. And uh, so this forum is really kind of at the cross point of that two school of thinking. And hopefully it could then spark uh, into different uh, meanings of rather um, uh, 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 antiquated thoughts on urbanism. And uh, so also this forum is made possible by a lot of um, individuals and uh, groups of interest. Uh, I would mention a few. It's made possible by uh, George Isaac, uh, distinguished uh, uh, scholarship on uh, design technology. It's a new endowment we have set just to make events like this happen. Uh, also, uh, faculties who are here have given a lot of uh, support to the idea of a improvised, spontaneous, uh, sometime opportunistic uh, forums like this. As you all know who work in university settings, it's not totally easy to make a place like this working in Saturday, on Saturday. <laughs> so there's a lot of efforts uh, involved, but also with uh, gratitude to our students who have dedicated the uh, last couple of days to really make the flow um, uh, work uh, smoothly. So I'm also supposed to give a few lines of um, the kind of uh, philosophical thinking behind this as a dean. Uh, I actually fly in from China yesterday. I wrote something on my Blackberry. I'll read uh, two lines, and if it makes sense, I'll continue. Otherwise, I will hand it to uh, Neil Leach. <laughs> um, it's actually not a secret that urbanism has run its course already, becoming either irrelevant uh, or uh, ill-performed. Ill we know that after Ram Kulas's um, uh, project on cities, uh, it has no effect whatsoever on the world. And obviously tracing back to, to Saskia Sassen, to, um, to um, writers like um, uh, 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 Jane Jacobs, and you can trace back. And uh, there were excitement around those work and around those thoughts, all the way back to uh, actually Tafuri. But uh, looking back uh, in the last 50 years, we actually find we have no influence whatsoever. 
to this monster, what that is urbanism. Uh, we've been having excitement talk about it, addressing it, but we have nothing to do with it. Uh, so the, the reason for that, obviously, is very complicated. I think that probably uh, there are two reasons for it. One is that um, architects or urban planners in urban practicing has, uh, have largely refused to understand our city, actually. Uh, so addressing it without understanding of it is really irrelevant and uh, completely um, uh, weak, incapable. To understand cities, I do think it's also not possible with the old tools. And uh, cities are formed by forces that are actually um, in such a way that is uh, beyond our physical boundary. Uh, let's say global finance. Uh, let's see, uh, global weather and now the kind of fashionable carbon deals around the globe, and political wealth, for example, uh, ambitions of politicians, and also uh, finances that actually have some local energy that is cannot be understood by uh, global financing. Somehow all those together and um, forming urban development that, um, that go beyond our understanding. And... Um, and then the role of architects in this large field of energy has remained actually unchanged. Uh, we are too obsessed with um, the form that we can uh, bestow to the city. We're too obsessed with um, writing manifestos but not physically participate in the process of urbanization. So uh, the role somehow needs to be changed into an agent of all those energies. But in the previous times, uh, we cannot do it. Actually, we, don't, uh, we do not have the new tool, the tools that enable us to do it. So that bring us to a crisis, and that is now really start to be peeling off, and we start to realize that um, the, the crisis um, has brought us uh, 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 two fronts. One is uh, the coordination and actually sometimes control of all these forces. And the other is how can we understand a large phenomenon from bottom up, which means a large uh, quantity of scenarios and unknown factors. And that is actually something behind what we are doing here is to looking into instrumentality that actually enable us to understand uh, either large array of quantities or large range of unknown scenarios. And many of you here knows that is uh, called uh, parametric something. But I rather, um, but that's actually an effort to, to enable us to actually have actually understanding of the large quantity of dynamics behind the city in the same time, um, acknowledge and the city in multiple ways. With this being said, um, I'd like to um, uh, introduce uh, Neil Leach to, um, to start the forum. Once again, um, welcome uh, to USC. Um, welcome. Uh, I am both the co-organizer of this event and also the chair of the first session, so let me first speak as the co-organizer. Um, and I'd like to mention first my other co-organizer, uh, Roland Ritter, who unfortunately can't be here this, th today. Um, he's ill, but I trust that he's on the other end of the, of the video um, recorder. It's actually, th th this event has been streamed live. Hello, Roland. Um, thank you for all your help. Um, so let me just say something briefly as, as a way to kind of ex uh, develop further um, Dean Ma's uh, introduction. Um, when I um, organized my first uh, conference back in I think 2001 in London, the RIBA, um, the conference at which actually Patrick and Manuel were both, both part, um, I can recall by, as I started by quoting Bill Gates who at the time made a prediction that by the end of the first decade of the 21st century, there would be nothing 
in our everyday lives that was not touched in some way by the computer. We are now in the final three weeks of that first decade of the 21st century, and it's worth reflecting on precisely how astonishing the impact has been, and recalling that, in fact, 10 years ago, there was almost no internet. Uh, the world was very different. And there has, in fact, been a, a very swift and rapid genealogy to the impact of the digital on, on the profession of architecture. Back in the 1990s, much of what was produced was, could be described largely as a form of, let's say, science fiction. There were references to virtual reality, to a world that was not quite reality, that was virtual. Um, I seldom see that expression used anymore. And what we got then is actually there's just been a, a ra very rapid development. At the time of that first conference, eFutures, that was then published as an edited volume, Designing for a Digital World, what was interesting was there were almost no buildings that had been built. Um, two years later, I organized a second conference again for the RBA, this time at the, in the University of Bath, and Greg Lynn, Cecil Bauman, UN Studio, Mark Burry, Bernard Cash, and a number of other interesting individuals were, were there. And by that time, there had been a significant development. In other words, the word of the digital, which had been um, somehow divorced from the world of tectonics, and one can begin to sort of look at the, the critique of Kenneth Frampton um, as a critique of the kind of the seemingly indulgent form making on the computer using Maya and other forms of program uh, as being a kind of critique that was saying architecture is, is, is really about the tectonic capacity of actual materials, less about the algorithmic potential of computer program. By 2002, 2003, we were able to uh, introduce a conference called Digital Tectonics, which was about the way in which the world of the tectonic had been increasingly informed by the immaterial world of the computer. There were buildings such as Foster's uh, um, British uh, British Museum roof uh, that was built according to a, a script written by Chris Williams, then a consultant uh, for Bureau Happold. And so, uh, uh, beyond that, there became a very rapid development um, uh, of the use of, of computation as part of the way that buildings would get built. And very soon we saw specialist uh, groups of researchers operating um, in most of the leading offices. So Gary Technologies established here in LA, uh, in, in, in London, um, the specialist modeling group at Foster's, the advanced geometry unit at Arabs, uh, Code at Zaha, at, at KPF, SOM, even conservative practices like Allies and Morrison started developing in-house research units to actually explore the potential uh, to use these tools to realize the complex buildings of today. And not just to parametrically model those things, and we saw the development of digital project, uh, generative components, uh, uh, paracloud, um, grasshopper, and so on, but also to facilitate the logistics of construction. There has been an absolute radical shift in terms of the, the, the impact of computation on the workings of the office. But now we, we enter a new, um, a, a further paradigm in which those tools that have been so influential are beginning to be used at an urban scale maybe controversially, but nonetheless they're beginning to, to be used. Um, and this conference in many ways marks that moment um, of a significant shift in the history of architecture and urbanism. The second, I guess, reason for this conference really was to um, establish a forum for debate. Dean Maher used the expression forum and it's really meant to be a forum rather than a, a, a standard conference in that we are structuring the whole day around um, roundtable discussions. We have invited some of the great thinkers from outside, good designers from outside to LA, um, uh, Patrick and Manuel and Francois, Marc Fornes, um, uh, Roland Snooks, uh, and so on. Um, and the idea is to bring those individuals and to enter into a dialogue with the what has now it's become very obvious, has become one of the kind of uh, the, the, the intense fields of intensity in terms of, uh, of digital design across the world. LA, uh, Southern California, and LA in particular, has established itself as being really a center uh, for digital design. So we have some of the great 
godfathers, if you can call them such individuals who are so young to be godfathers, but people like um, Marcus Novak and Greg Lynn. And I think, you know, I, I've got to mention Gary Technologies again has been a very significant um, contribution to the whole field. These are kind of LA-based people, and, and along with a, a much younger generation, um, people like Eleanor Manfredini uh, and Nick Pisca, um, are, are beginning to, I think, establish LA as a place that has become um, a kind of like a, a center alongside London, one of the two centers of digital design around the world. So this event is really structured about that, about creating a dialogue and recognizing both in terms of time and of place, we've, met, we've reached a, a crucial juncture in the history of our discipline. And, uh, and we also want to pre present this not as a, um, a kind of manifesto for a new way of thinking, but really to establish a platform for a critical debate about those techniques and approaches. Um, so the whole day then is going to be structured around, around um, uh, a, a series of, of lectures and then roundtable discussions with um, including some astonishingly um, interesting people, the wealth of, of, of talent that we have in this area. I now want to move on to uh, introduce um, our first speaker, uh, Mamel Delanda. Um, in the, uh, the handout, there is a, a, bio, a biography, a brief bio of all the, uh, those taking part, and um, Manuel's many books are listed there. I won't um, repeat them all, but I'll simply say that uh, he has at least one book that I think is, uh, and certainly for my, those students who study with me here um, will know his book, um, A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History, as being one of the most essential pieces of reading on urban growth, urban patterns of growth, alongside another book um, with the word thousand in the title, A Thousand Plateau by Deleuze and Guattari. I think what uh, Manuel has established is um, effectively he has begun to uh, track and point out and make explicit a whole series of new um, areas for investigation in, within urbanism and within material, material culture. Um, what I will say though, um, and I think this is really important, is that Manuel has effectively, I think, uh, and been very influential in doing this because he has been um, lecturing in front of um, some of the most important audiences over the last 10, 15 years at Columbia, uh, in New York, um, at uh, um, UPenn more recently, in Pratt and Sark, and now we're hoping to bring him to USC. Uh, he's had an enormous impact on, uh, on architectural culture. Um, and what he's done most effectively, I think, and very importantly for architectural culture, is embrace the possibility of theorizing science and technology as an area of intellectual endeavor. In other words, when I was a student at Cambridge some years ago, uh, engineers and scientists were seen to be those boring guys with kind of white lab coats on who were part of some kind of positivistic discourse that had nothing to do with the real intellectual endeavor of architecture that was largely to do with history and theory. Now it seems that uh, with the development of courses such as the DRL at the AA or the MTech course there, increasingly people are being to recognize the, the necessity um, to actually embrace the field of technology in terms of material culture and also digital culture as part of, of the discipline itself. Manuel then has been a, kind of a crucial figure in transforming the discipline in that sense. Manuel is not an architect. He is, um, he is an artist by background. He comes from Mexico. It's interesting today that all our speakers, um, apart from one, are from, from, from other countries. We've got speakers from France, Germany, uh, Mexico, uh, Australia. Uh, Casey Reese, I think, is our one token American speaker. Um, and Manuel came to the States as, a, uh, as an artist. He was a, a very significant um, uh, maker of, of short documentary, of short films, and then became what he describes as a philosophy hacker. A philosophy hacker and also someone who was, who was learning programming. Um, and he is therefore a kind of, we could describe him maybe a street philosopher. He has no academic credentials, but he is highly respected within the area of philosophy uh, today. Um, I'm not gonna say any more about him because I, uh, what I will say is that when I was teaching at Columbia, I became a, a student of Manuel's. Uh, I didn't know, maybe that there, were, there were professors who were in the audience there, but I think what he, what he does has is the capacity to explain in an astonishingly lucid way um, the complexities of philosophical thinking and with a kind of like a performance art that makes him quite unique. 
So it is a, it is a great pleasure to be able to welcome Manuel to you t today. Um, and uh, I look forward to the possibility of many future discussions with Manuel uh, here at USC. Manuel de Landa. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Well, as Neil said, I'm not an architect. I'm a philosopher. I call myself a philosopher. Uh, so what I want to do is just get the ball rolling on the subject so that then you can, you know, to kind of set the stage by discussing a few philosophical ideas around the question of urban dynamics and urban growth and, and uh, the role, the, uh, the historical role that cities have played uh, as agents, as true actors of history, because that is the way I've been conceiving them from the beginning of, uh, of, of my career. Uh, there's, of course, many different levels of scale at which historical agency can, can, can occur. There's the level of individual persons, you know, a Napoleon or, or, or a great inventor like Edison or a great scientist like Einstein as persons are historical agents and they affect historical change. Then there is the types of effects that occur only at the level of communities. You know, most social justice movements have achieved the effects they have achieved, they have the rights they have extracted from government organizations uh, as communities. And so communities can also be a, a historical agents, historical actors. Uh, there's then the role that institutional organizations, whether universities, hospitals, prisons, barracks, uh, uh, the factories, uh, uh, the whole, you know, and the whole variety of government bureaucracies and so on, who can also play or which can also play the role of historical agents sometimes. And as we go up in scale, we reach the scale of cities and later on nation states, which are also historical agents. So that gives us a sense of history as a multi-layered history with temporalities and rhythms occurring at all these different levels, uh, which basically shatters our notion of a unilinear history in which you have to make choices as to whether it is the individual person who is important or it is the system as a whole that is important. We now have a sense of history occurring at multiple levels, uh, individuals, communities, organizations, cities, regions that, 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 and provinces and entire nation states or kingdoms or empires as also historical agents. Now, another aspect of my work is, has been to try to import some ideas from physics, chemistry, and biology, particularly uh, those concerning nonlinear phenomena in which, in which matter, whether it's physical matter, whether it's chemical matter, or biological matter, self-organizes through the interactions of simple elements and generate complexity at the level of the whole. From the very beginning, when I began reading about these things, I realized that this could be applied to human history. The problem is that when you're dealing with populations of molecules that only perform collisions with one another, as in physics, or when you're dealing with populations of molecules that synthesize, that, that merge with one another, fuse with one another, form bonds with one another, and synthesize new molecules, as in the case of chemistry, or when you're dealing with simple organisms like ants or bees or uh, termites that also self-organize into colonies and, and hives, well, you're dealing with entities that are basically physical, that or more specifically, entities that do not make decisions, that do not make choices. We don't have to see choices as optimally rational, as some economists do, to believe that, that we, as human beings, make choices. We make decisions. We sometimes don't have enough information to make our decisions, and we make, informations on bad, uh, we make decisions on bad information, incomplete information, but we have to live with the consequences of our decisions and we have to live with the consequences of our choices. Therefore, the, question, the first question that arises whenever you try to think about how to use ideas about self-organization in molecules or ants to apply them to the case of cities or communities or organizations 
is wh at what exactly, at what level do those ideas apply? Since in, the, in physics and biology, they are about unthinking entities, and we are thinking entities. We're decision-making entities. We're intentional entities. And the answer is that self-organization occurs always in, in the human realm at the level of collective unintended consequences of intentional action. The, that formula is perfect because it, it incorporates the idea that we are intentional beings, that we are beings that make choices, but at the same time that when many of us make choices and when our choices are based on the choices of others, there are always collective unintended consequences. And it is that level, the level of collective unintended consequences that we need to theorize at the level of self-organization. I'm gonna give you a few examples uh, uh, in my talk. Uh, another thing that we need to understand as a, as a as a prelude to what I'm going to say is, okay, well, let's assume that yes, certain emergent effects, certain effects that don't belong to individuals because they are unintended collective consequences that arise from the interactions between individual persons, let's assume that those things exist. How can then we bring computer simulations into the, into a, the process of understanding or exploring or developing intuitions about this collective unintended consequences. It would seem that we need to define what emergence is at the level of simulations. We already have a definition at the level of human beings. It is those consequences that emerge or that arise as a product of our interactions and that cannot be reduced to the level of individual choices. So it's is, a, is properties or capacities that emerge from interactions that are irreducible to the interactants. But what about computers? What exactly is emergent in a simulation? Here, instead of going through some detailed examination, I'm just gonna uh, define it by example. I'm sure everybody in this room has at some play or another, at some point or another, played with the game of life, Conway's game of life, which is very simple, Cellular, cellular automata. Well, in the game of life, you know, it, it's deceptively simple because all you see on the screen is a bunch of cells, a bunch of squares, a grid. But if, if we implemented a cellular automaton as a physical entity, it would really be a population of robots, or more precisely, a population of computing devices, the simplest computing devices called finite state automata, which are basically computing devices that compute without using any memory. You know, as you begin adding memory to finite state automata, you get all the, the, the hierarchy of different automata that exist in, in computer science, such as push down automata, linear bounded automata, and at the end, with the maximum capacity for memory, Turing machines. At the very bottom is finite state automata, which are the simplest, but if you take an entire population of them and you hook them, let's imagine them right now as physical entities, as a little black box that you can, that you can make to compute certain, certain simple things, the kinds of things that you can compute without memory, uh, and you wire them together with electrical wires so that they can send electrical signals to one another, and you take a whole population of those automata, you get what is a cellular automaton. When we use computer simulations of cellular automata, like the, the game of life, that becomes invisible, but it is important to keep in mind that every single one of those cells in our screen, when we bring the game of life uh, 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 on the screen, is in fact an automaton. It's a simulation of a finite state automata, but where, where we're dealing with that is a population of simple robots, so to speak, or programmable computing machines that are interacting with one another. The wires have disappeared from the screen because now the edges and corners shared by the, by, by the cells are right now a, a, a topologically connecting all those, all those automata so that they can have relationships of neighborhood with others. There's relationships of proximity. When one runs the game of life, the interactions between the finite state automata are, by definition, not emergent. 
They are not emergent because they are specified by rules. And this is something I want you to keep in mind throughout my talk. Anything in any simulation that is specified by rules is by definition not emergent because it's being deterministically or if the rule is statistical, probabilistically determined by those rules. But anything else that emerges from the interactions between the finite state automata is, in fact, an emergent phenomenon. In the case of the game of life, the simplest thing would be, of course, a glider, which I'm sure everybody has seen moving through your screen because it's one of those naturally emergent entities in the game of life. A glider, the best way of understanding what a glider is, is to think of a wave in a stadium, you know, in a, in a sports stadium. In a sports stadium, the only rule that you have to follow to, to, to create an emergent wave is look at the, at the, at the guy on your left. When, when the guy on your left stands up to do the wave, then get ready to do the wave. When he comes down and sits down again, then you stand up and then you come down and remain seated until that guy on your left goes up again. That's a simple rule. Check your guy on the left, get ready when he stands up, stand up after he sits down. If you follow those three rules mechanically, you get that wave going through the stadium. Well, a glider and other mo moving structures in the game of life are just like that. But nevertheless, they are emergent. And one of the, there are two tests for emergence here. One of them is whether you can tell in advance, whether you can predict in advance what's going to happen when gliders themselves interact. Not the finite state automata, which remain in place, but these moving patterns of activity. And the fact is that you cannot predict what gliders will do in collisions. Collisions between two gliders, for instance, have several, you know, a dozen or, or more outcomes, and you need to know you know, whether the collision will produce a new glider, whether the collision will, will, will just eliminate both gliders and leave a lot of debris and so on, depends on the angle and the timing of the collision, and you need to dis discover those effects empirically, that is, by trying them out. The second condition is whether you can, using glider streams, build something out of them, build, use them as parts to create something else. Here I recommend you, because it is impossible to, to, uh, to convey this just verbally, that whenever you have a chance to, to uh, get online, just Google the words Conway, just Google, Google the words Game of Life Turing Machine, just like that, Game of Life Turing Machine. The first entry that comes out from the search is a person that has already created an entire computer made out of glider streams, that is made out of what is called glider guns that are shuttles that uh, 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 cr crash against one another and every few cycles produce a glider. Those glider streams, the presence of a glider is a one, the absence of a glider is a zero, so now you have your stream, your digital streams. And when you go to that site, there, you know, he has a bunch of Java animations uh, showing you the different parts of the computer, the guy and with the help of a lot of friends in the community of, of, of Game of Life enthusiasts, has actually built a Turing machine out of these component parts in the Game of Life. So that's the second test of emergence. Can you build something else at another scale, just as I was saying before, building communities and organizations out of persons, building cities out of many communities and many organizations, and going one scale in the part to whole relationship at a time, if you can build them in the computer out of emergent entities, then that other entity is also emergent. So that's going to be our criteria in for the rest of the talk. If rules that specify the behavior is not emergent, but if something comes out of those rule-specified interactions, that emergent entity is something interesting, and that emergent entity in the simulation is what can give us or sharpen our intuitions about the collective unintended consequences of intentional action. Now, cellular automata themselves, not the game of life, but other, other, with, uh, other rules for interaction between cellular automata, can be used to model very simple aspects about cities. For instance, physical allocation of space and the growth of cities via simple allocations of space. Clearly, cellular automata, because 
in, in, but in, once they are applied to urban centers, you don't get moving gliders or anything like that. It's mostly static cells that grow around a, a nucleus and develop into clusters. Cannot really capture decision making, cannot, cannot capture, for instance, locational decision making, the decisions of somebody to move into a particular neighborhood and locate his or her residence in a particular neighborhood, or the decision by an organization to locate itself in a particular office district or a particular retail district, or the particular decisions of a community to move from one neighborhood to the suburbs. Uh, but nevertheless, they can capture certain basic things about cities. And this is an important thing to keep in mind, that we can model and use simulations of different degrees of detail to capture a, a, a unintended consequences at the level of urban growth at different levels of detail. Cellular automata being the simplest type of, of simulation can only capture things like, for instance, does the growth rate of a city, how rapidly or slowly it's growing, have an effect on the morphology of the city. S using cellular automata with specific uh, interaction rules, you can in fact verify that the faster the city grows, the more multi-clustered a city will tend to be. The slower a city grows, the more it will tend to be uh, 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 to grow around a single cluster. Now, those those insights need to be, of course, then tested against reality, against specific historical cases. We need to uh, um, calibrate the temporality of the cellular automata simulation to that of real time in the growth of real cities to match speed to speed. But nevertheless, those, those will be the kinds of very rough insights that one can get from cellular automata. Now, those insights can in turn be used for a couple of purposes. One. If you are an urban planner who is trying to develop intuitions in yourself about how a particular plan would affect the growth of a particular city, you can use them to model present day cities. But another application would simply to understand past cities and the growth patterns of past cities. This is especially important for historians, for urban historians. Those consequences are not, the, the use of simulations to understand the past don't have anything to do with planning or with actual, the, 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 you know, being an urbanist in the proper sense of the word, it has to do with understanding how past cities like Venice or Paris or Amsterdam grew the way they grew in the past. And what you're trying to reproduce at a very gross and very little detail level with cellular automata, it is precisely those growth patterns. It's a very limited way of using simulations, but nevertheless, it already throws some light on questions about physical allocation of space. You are glossing over the actual decision making, the locational decision making that goes on, assuming that simply there are certain statistical tendencies, like once there is enough people in one cluster, other cells will tend to cluster together, or saturation effects, once there are too many people in a particular cluster, or their, or their cells will not tend to glue to it because there's not enough space for everybody. And those density effects, which occur at a very impersonal level of scale, can be captured at the level of cellular automata. Now the question here is, of course, how do we come up with the right interaction rules for the cells to give us the results that we need in specific historical cases when we're trying to understand a part the particular growth pattern of a city in the past, a city for which we have historical data. So one way, you know, one way of de de developing those interaction rules is by hand, by trial and error. You, you try some interaction rules, then you see what pattern emerges, and if it matches the pattern that is historically, uh, 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 that there's evidence for it uh, historically, then those interaction rules will be interesting. Another way is to tr use other types of simulations to search the space of possible interaction rules. In other words, you're doing basically the same thing, except that instead of searching the space of possible rules by hand, so to speak, you use another piece of software to automate the searching of that space. That other piece of software typically is some form of search algorithm, one of the most successful one of which is the genetic algorithm. Now, the genetic algorithm is, sim is a simulation of, as everybody knows, is a simulation of Darwinian evolution. The problem with the genetic algorithm is that it 
it, almost nothing in the genetic algorithm is emergent. The chromosomes, which are basically bit strings, strings of ones and zeros, do not reproduce themselves, so, so self-reproduction is not emergent, as it is in other, uh, in, other, in, other, in other simulations of artificial life. There is a specific program that, that makes the copies of those chromosomes for the next generation. Because the, 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 the bit strings do not reproduce themselves, therefore mutations and sexual recombination are not emergent either. They have to be applied exogenously as operators that operate on those bit strings. And finally, the evaluation of fitness, which in, in regular evolution is, is the, the effect of predators, of parasites, or symbiosis, or climate, that is, of factors that are part and parcel of the ecosystem. Here, the evaluation, in the genetic algorithm, the evaluation of fitness is also done exogenously. There is a, a specific program called a fitness function into which you code what you want evolution to produce, and it, it checks every generation of, of bit strings to see what's, what is approaching your goal and what's not approaching your goal and allows those that are closer to the goal to reproduce more than the other ones. And that, that way you're basically approaching your goal little by little in an evolutionary kind of way. So the genetic algorithm as a model of real evolution is extremely limited. The only type of evolution I can think that it could possibly model is the, the type of evolution that happened before the genetic code that is, naked RNA molecules before DNA even existed and before there was a membrane giving that, those RNA molecules a, uh, a body. So disembodied replicators, it, which is an important question because it was through the interactions between those disembodied replicators that the genetic code eventually emerged. Nevertheless, the one thing that is emergent in the genetic algorithm, which is the search capabilities, is, it, it are, can be used in parametric design in a whole variety of ways. In the case that I was just talking about, you can, for instance, hook up cellular automata and genetic algorithms. The genetic algorithm would search for rules of interaction. Every generation, the rules found by a particular generation would be tried out in an actual cellular automaton. The, the fitness function would compare the, the actual historical growth pattern to the growth pattern produced by that. The difference between the target pattern and what you are getting right now would become the, the, the fitness evaluation or the fitness value, and then the whole, the whole process is repeated again, slowly using the genetic al algorithm to discover the rules of interaction that would yield the actual historical pattern. That would be one way of hooking up two different simulations to do a search in the space of possible rules. But a more interesting of the genetic algorithm is when you begin not only embodying the replicators, but situating them in space. The reason why cellular automata are, suggest themselves almost immediately as, as something that can be used to study urban questions is because cellular automata, by the fact that the interactions are, de are defined by nearby, by, by relationships of proximity, that is by spatial neighborhoods, incorporate space directly into the simulation. It's, it's, it's not, space is not being simulated, it's actually being enacted by those neighborhood relations. Disembodied genetic algorithms do not have special relationships. The, the bit strings occupy, you know, if you want to kind of imagine what they are, they are inside a chemical reactor that's well stirred so that you know, the stirring itself is constantly disrupting neighborhood relationships. So basically, in a genetic algorithm, you pick, you know, one bit string from here, one bit string from there, and, and match them to make the next generation. There's no real proximity relationships. But the inventor of the genetic algorithm, John Holland, the following project was one which is called ECHO, E-C-H-O, in which the genetic algorithms were given a body that is a, that is a spatial a, a membrane, so to speak, and so they were situated in space that in which resources, meta, a, a, a energetic resources, simulated energetic resources were dispersed in a particular uh, pattern. And finally, they were, and this is the most important thing uh, to achieve embodiment, they were given a metabolism. By giving them a metabolism, that is by 
making their survival a function of how much food they eat in a generation, you basically endogenize fitness. The fitness evaluations that in a regular genetic algorithm were being performed from the outside by the programmer or by its representative, the fitness function, are now performed within the simulation and therefore fitness evaluations are now emergent. Echoes, creatures are very, very simple. Nevertheless, they are already an example of what is now called agent-based modeling. The moment you embody something, the moment you situate that body in space, and the moment that the behavior of that something, even, even if it's determined by rules and therefore the behavior itself is not emergent, is already a form of agency. Again, the, the behavior of most agents is, is, there, is a, a determined by rules, so it's not emergent, but what we want to now know is whether many of those agents interacting in specific ways can give rise to specific patterns. And again, we would need to decide in advance before running a simulation at what level of scale in the life of a city do we want to get these effects. For instance, do we want to get effects as to the formation of communities and the formation of uh, uh, solidarity within the communities that, for instance, would, would inhabit an ethnic neighborhood in a big city, a Chinatown or a little Italy. To do that, to get, to, to get cooperation to emerge spontaneously from the interaction between agents, embodied and situated, the best way to do it is to either couple echo type agents, that is agents with a metabolism, and prisoner dilemma or game theoretic models. Again, this is a, a hybrid of simulations. Or you can couple prisoner dilemma models. Remember, the prisoner dilemma is simply decisions as to cooperate or cheat on somebody else. Your typical prisoner dilemma situation em embodies the, the fact that Cooperation is in fact the best outcome, but cooperation is always endangered by the fact that certain selfish uh, uh, decisions can actually be better for one of the individuals but worse from the others. And so it, the reason why it's a dilemma, a social dilemma, is because of course the best outcome for, for the social entity would be cooperation, but cooperation can always be endangered by free riders, by selfish individuals who do not reciprocate every time. The prisoner dilemma is something that has been studied in game theory tremendously, but simulations gave it a big push. You can study prisoner's dilemma purely mathematically, but you can st study it also by simply unleashing agents within the computer, give them the rules of prisoner dilemma, and see what happens you know, as an emergent outcome. Does, does a community of cooperators emerge? Under what conditions a community of cooperators emerge? You can give them a special dimension by, by coupling prisoner dilemma with cellular automata, as, ha as has been done, in fact. You can give them an intergenerational dimension by coupling prisoner's dilemma with genetic algorithms, as it, in fact, has been done, to see whether a particular strategy of cooperation, such as the famous strategy tit for tat, in which the, the agent simply reciprocates a, a, both cooperation on, and, and cheating in, in, in every other move, whether certain, some cooperative in, uh, uh, strategies not only come to dominate a particular community, but survive over many, many generations. Because of course, if we want to study the life of cities and the life of communities in cities, what we would want to know is if a particular, the solidarity in a particular community is long lasting. And how fragile that solidarity is to immigrants that come and do not play the game of cooperation, that is, begin cheating and not reciprocating. So that is another example of how we can use combinations of different simulations in order to obtain particular effects and in, in order to develop in ourselves certain intuitions as to what collective unintended consequences of intentional actions can be. This is still, though, do not, because all the decisions are being is explicitly stated by rules, it still doesn't give us a, enough resolution to model things at the individual person level. Still, without getting to that point, there's another simulation by Axtell and, and uh, let me just get my names right here. Axtell and Ipstein, who develop a, a relatively simple simulation called Sugarscape, 
Sugar escape is a kind of cellular automaton, but in which the cells now can move. They can move to different locations, but everything determined by rules, whether deterministic rules or probabilistic rules. Therefore, the behavior of the agents, which are really, really just little squares, is not emergent. Nevertheless, in sugar escape, you can unleash a population of this very deterministically determined agents and, 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 and non-emergent agency and get effects at the level of the collectivity. You can, for instance, place different amounts of sugar, which is a, is a, a virtual resource. You know, they, they, the little agents have a metabolism. They need to eat a certain amount of sugar per unit of time in order to be able to survive. Otherwise, they die, and therefore, they are embodied. As I said before, giving agents a metabolism is the surest way of giving them a body. It's the surest way of giving them some kind of direct energetic link to their environment in which now they have needs that they must satisfy. And of course, sugar escape agents are also situated in space. They're embodied and situated. By distributing resources in different ways, you can get a certain insights into the formation of very simple settlements, not cities, but more like villages uh, or, or perhaps hunter-gatherer camps uh, as, as agents who's, who can see the vision they have is really determined by rules, so it's not emergent either, and can move towards resources and because of their metabolism have a, 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 a tendency to stay in a place where there are resources, sugar escape very, very rapidly generates congregations of, of agents. And a more important result, perhaps the most important result that sugar escape uh, uh, it, it has achieved so far, one of the most important collective unintended consequences that, that, that is still valid in our societies, prices, has been seen to emerge in sugar escape simulations. Prices, and this is one, one reason why prices have always mystified people, emerge as unintended consequences of intentional action. And if, in order to imagine this, we of course need to imagine a bazaar that is an organization within a city, a very specific organization in a particular place in a city, a bazaar in which there are no monopolists and no oligopolists uh, uh, manipulating prices, you know, storing grain in a warehouse uh, when it's cheap and then you know, unleashing it into the market when it's expensive. The moment you have people manipulating prices, prices are almost by definition not emergent. This is something that many economists refuse to accept because they would have to divide the economy into the part of the economy that is self-organizing, small businesses and so on, from the economy which is not self-organizing, big business, you know, in which, in which, the, in which they don't, there's no real competition a la Adam Smith, but more like rivalries, as in, as in military organizations that are rivals of each other. And, and when you have big organizations, and this is something that, of course, we're living through right now, organizations can become too large to fail, and they have to be rescued by governments, and they can privatize profits while socializing losses when the governments have to bail them out. That is not market behavior by any stretch of the imagination. That is planning behavior just like government organizations would do. So economists refuse to make this distinction sharp because then that would mean that they would have two different theories for, for, for economics, one that applies to hundreds and hundreds of small businesses in which competition is truly anonymous, and the other one which applies exclusively to oligopolies and monopolies. But nevertheless, that distinction exists, and historians like Fernand Brodel have been making the point all along, Fernand Brodel being the most important economic historian of our time, he is dead now, but if there was a, a, novel, a, economic, a novel prize for, for, for economic history, as opposed to economics, uh, it probably would be uh, given to Brodel posthumously because he is, is the guy who has opened our eyes as to how different history has really been from what we used to imagine, a sequence of feudalism, capitalism, socialism, and simplistic you know, uh, uh, narratives of history like that. Fernand Brodel, from the very beginning of his, of his career, made a difference and the distinction between big business and small businesses. To get back to the point, in sugar, in sugar scape, you can 
in addition to the metabolic rules, the vision rules, and the motion rules you can give to the agents, you can give them trading rules, which are basically just a way of capturing the bargaining or hag haggling that takes place in an actual bazaar, in an actual market. By giving short escape agents trading rules, the, the, the authors that I just mentioned, Axtell and Epstein, have been able to get prices to emerge spontaneously, just like gliders emerge spontaneously in, cellular autom in, in the game of life, in a system of very, very simple agents. When, and by, by that I mean agents that are not at all optimally rational, as, as, as microeconomics would, would, would demand, agents with very limited means, uh, limit, very limited ways of matching means to ends, that is with a, what, what is called satisfying or compromising rationality, what you, the best you can do is match means to ends in, in the best way possible and a way that is satisfactory. Uh, the, the agents in sugar escape have even less rationality than that, and yet, by their, by their interactions, they can manage to create a bazaar-like situation where prices emerge spontaneously. So again, that would be another example of how to develop intuitions in ourselves uh, a, a rel relating to collective unintended consequences of intentional action, but now at a, at a scale smaller than that of a whole city, so a, a particular organization, a particular space within a city. Finally, if we want to understand a, 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 the decision-making process, the, the locational decisions made by persons, communities, organizations, which give a, a real dynamics of a city, for instance, land use dynamics, in which a particular neighborhood, which is used for a while as an industrial site, a, a, the rents go up, too, too fast and the, and the industry moves to the suburbs or moves farther away to some industrial hinterland, the neighborhood now becomes abandoned, so immigrants come in to take advantage of the cheap rents, then eventually artists begin moving in to take advantage of the cheap rents but begin gentrifying the neighborhood. I mean, that's just one example of land use succession in which a particular area of the city is al the function that is allocated to it is emerges, but from the dynamics of immigration, rent uh, a, a, a dynamics, and, and, and changes, and so on. If we want to understand that level of detail, we need to now give our agents emergent decision making. They cannot be agents like Sugarscape, they cannot be agents like Echo, in which the rules determine the behavior. The latest generation of agents, or as they are called, multi-agent systems, because you, you don't ever have a single agent, you always have a population of agents, otherwise you would not have collective unintended consequences. The latest generation of multi-agent systems is called Belief, Desire, and Intention Agents, BDI for short. And those are the ones that we really need if we want to get enough resolution to understand things like land, use succession dynamics in cities, how a particular office district becomes a retail district, how a particular residential district eventually becomes office space, how a suburb that began as an attachment to a city eventually becomes differentiated enough offering a, a, a office space, offering retail space, offering government a, a, a organization space that the city starts becoming multi-centered if we want to understand those processes, again, as unintended consequences as opposed to planned consequences, we need BDI agents. Now, beliefs and desires, in this particular case, are modeled using a very old theory in, in Anglo-American analytical philosophy. Beliefs and desires in Anglo-American philosophy are modeled as attitudes towards the meaning of sentences, of declarative sentences, that is, sentences like, Columbus discovered America in 1492. There's sentences that state falsely or truly a fact. Uh, the, 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 sentence, the meaning of a sentence is called a proposition. That's just a technical term. That is what a sentence in English and the same sentence in Spanish have in common. So it is, it is independent of the actual words you use, the actual syntax, the actual phonology, the actual... Uh, uh, but it is the semantic context of the sentence, it's called a proposition, and so beliefs and desires are modeled as propositional attitudes. Because the model exists, has existed for 50 or so years, it was relatively easy for designers of multi-agent systems to simply incorporate propositional attitudes in the design of their agents. So now we have agents 
whose beliefs can change because they can acquire information uh, about their, their, their environment, about what other, the, all the choices of other agents are making, encapsulate that information in the forms of declarative sentences and then have attitudes towards that sentence. Having an attitude towards a sentence, say, believing that if you die a martyr, you will find 70 virgins in heaven, has definite consequences for behavior, as everybody, as everybody by now knows. Beliefs can be entirely false, and I almost, almost positive that the whole 70 virgin thing is false, <laughs> and it does not matter if it's gonna make you blow yourself up. So false beliefs, true beliefs, it doesn't matter. It is the attitude, and of course, it is the intensity of the belief. You can believe that there are 70 virgins in heaven, but sort of say, yeah, but it might be a metaphor. <laughs> or you can believe that it is literally true, and that is what makes you blow yourself up. So the intensity of beliefs can also be added simply as another parameter to the agents. Desires are similar. Again, these are, we're not talking so much about desires like I desire sex or I desire uh, some fruit salad or I desire some specific thing that I have experienced, but more like desires about, you know, I desire to do good for my country or I desire to, uh, I have a, a, an intense desire for eternal salvation. Desires that can only be expressed using language. Now, clearly, we also need to eventually model agents with desires about experiences, not just about sentences, and that can be done by the use of neural nets, another, another genre of simulations I'm not gonna mention in detail unless it comes up during the question and answer period because it would take me too long to explain how they work, but neural nets proceed entirely with that language. You don't program a neural net, you train a neural net the way you would train your dog to catch a frisbee. And neural nets, therefore, operate entirely on the basis of pattern recognition and pattern extraction. They can extract, if you show a neural net a population of zebras with all the variation in camouflage and heights and, 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 and shapes, it, a neural net can extract a prototype, a kind of a, a, a zebra prototype, and then use that internal emergent representation to recognize zebras that have not been part of the training process. So neural nets give us for the first time a way of thinking about perception and, and experience in terms of intensities, intensities of color, intensities of sound, intensities of touch, intensities of flavor and aroma, as opposed to just language. However, BDI agents do not use neural nets, so I'm not even gonna continue with that, with that question. But nevertheless, with BDI agents, we have for the first time the ability for the formation. So just to conclude this, this brief introduction, I, I wanna say that a, 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 while it is perfectly clear that BDI agents are what we need in order to get the resolution, the level of resolution that we would need in order to be able to model more complex urban processes like land use succession. Nevertheless, we should always keep in mind that history always occurs at different levels and that sometimes it is okay to abstract away from the lower levels if, if, one, gonna, if one is going to account for <coughs> larger scale processes and that therefore there's plenty of room for all the different types of simulations that I'd mentioned uh, despite the fact that it might give us a sense of artificiality to use cellular automata, which only model, as I said, the effect of rapidity of growth on morphology, you know, sometimes, and th this is the art of modeling, not only with simulations, but also with mathematics in physics and, in physics and chemistry and biology. There's not a single physicist that in, in, in this planet has never there been one that models the entire thing. Models are always specific, concrete. They always have presuppositions, that is the things that the model is not going to explain, as well as something that the model explains. If the model has an emergent behavior, then that emergent behavior can serve as an explanation. But of course, many of the things that you added to the model, for instance, the rule generated behavior, are presuppositions that are not explained. But then you net, you get another model that explains those presuppositions, in turn making other presuppositions and then yet other model that explains those presuppositions. And it is only by the interaction of 
a population of models that physicists have been able to define their subject matter, the domain of study, electromagnetism, gravity, uh, 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 quantum physics, that chemists have been able to define their domain of, of, of study, and, and therefore we should adopt that idea also at the level of both urbanism for the future, when you're really doing planning and where, when you're doing a, 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 trying to develop intuitions about how a city will grow because it is a present city, or urban history, when we're trying to develop intuitions as to what were the process of growth and allocation, economic and physical allocation of space and decision and locational decision making that produce a particular growth pattern in the past. Uh, and so just to conclude, cities are and are and have been important historical actors, even after being swallowed by nation states and kingdoms, they con at least some of the cities, maritime metropolis in many cases, have continued to be uh, a network that, that go, cuts across borders of nation states, those same nation states that capture certain cities as their capitals, made them their national capitals, and use those national capitals to spread a standard language throughout their territory, to spread a standard culture. Even those nation states still have ports, port cities that are still looking to the outside, that are making networks with other port cities, and which are today, if you think about it, the backbone of globalization. Globalization is not as if it was a process that's floating on top of nation states. It is a process that, whose backbone is a network of maritime metropolises, some of which, like Amsterdam or Rotterdam, have existed for centuries and have been playing this role for centuries. So whether we're trying to understand urban growth for the future as urban planners, or we're trying to understand urban growth for the past as urban historians, Simulations, particularly used in conjunction and in hybrids, as I was saying before, can be a, an incredibly important tool to develop intuitions in ourselves about unintended collective consequences of intentional action. Thank you very much.